Hello, my name is Leslie Shannon. I am Nokia's Head of Ecosystem and Trend Scouting located in Silicon Valley in California. And I'm here to talk to you today about the metaverse and what is it and why should we care? Now, before I get started though, I need to kind of clarify Nokia's position on the metaverse. Um, just to be clear, we did sell our phone business to Microsoft almost 10 years ago. Today, Nokia is a business that mostly makes um, network equipment for the phone companies of the world and and large uh, companies that want to have their own you know wireless or wireline network so we're very much a b2b business and the reason we care about the metaverse is that we can see it's going to generate a lot of traffic a lot of really intense video and um, high quality, high definition, rendered computer graphics in the future. So we need to make sure that the networks that we're building can actually carry all this traffic. So so don't think because you see Nokia on the agenda for this that there's gonna be like a virtual reality headset from Nokia, no. <laughs> so just okay, now that we've got that out of the way, let's start taking a look at the metaverse and, and what it is. So, so I'm gonna start this talk about the future by looking back at the past for a moment. There's a terrific interview with Bill Gates on David Letterman back in November, 1995, that, that shows how difficult it can be to see a good future and yet understand the possibilities and explain it to somebody else. David Letterman in this, he asks Bill Gates, what is the internet? And Gates is like, oh, people can publish information. Everybody has a homepage. You can send mail. And 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 Letterman is like, yeah, well, I, I heard you can do that with like the regular mail, or you could do that with the radio. And and everything that Bill Gates talks about, the me the, the internet being able to do, David Letterman's like, we already have ways to do these things. And and the problem is that when we're stuck, well, where we are in the present. It's really hard to think of the new things that are going to be possible, enabled by the next, the next big paradigm, because all we can see is what's around us. And so Bill Gates really struggled to find what was really unique about the internet. And it turns out that the real power of the internet didn't come from just the internet. It came, the really disruptive, game-changing stuff came with the internet being put together with mobile technology and location technology. And now you've got things like Uber and Airbnb and, you know, and suddenly whole industries are being disrupted. So, so the important thing is not the metaverse. It's, it's going to be the metaverse in conjunction with a lot of other kinds of things. Um, then I'll, I'll get to some of those things in this in this discussion today. Um, but also, it's it's really hard. We can kind of see what the metaverse might be, but how transformational it might be, that's very difficult for us to see because all we can really do is talk about these future technologies in the terms that we understand today. And and so we're kind of we're all we're all in Bill Gates's chair today here. But okay, so from Bill Gates to Mark Zuckerberg, um, Facebook has announced it's developing into a metaverse company. Uh, okay. All right, what does that mean? Well, in that same talk where um, Mark Zuckerberg mentioned that back in July, um, what he said, you can think about the metaverse as an embodied internet, where instead of viewing it, you're in it. So this idea of immersion, this idea of Im embeddedness, and you can feel you're present with people in other places and so on and so forth. And so, so okay, so presence and, and, and connection with others. Um, but you know, uh, also in this talk, Mark Zuckerberg mentioned um, the venture capitalist, uh, Matthew Ball. And and whatever you think about Mark Zuckerberg, Matthew Ball is somebody to really pay attention to. He has done a lot of thinking about exactly what the metaverse is. And I, I really recommend that if you're curious about this, go check out Matthew Ball's Metaverse Primer series of essays that were published online in um, uh, June 2021. So Matthew Ball Metaverse Primer, just Google that. And, and he really looks at the different elements um, that will make the metaverse and where the state of each one of these today and how we're going to get to um, to where it goes. But the very short version is that the elements of the metaverse include the union of the physical and the digital worlds. So, so the bringing of 
digitalness around us into our physical world, persistent avatars, so a sense of your, your digital self, a fully operational economy, interoperability across platforms, and then this decentralized operations. So there's not a single owner of the metaverse, like the internet today. And so to kind of change these into more industry buzzword terms, that means AR, VR, and XR, XR being mixed reality or extended reality, which is kind of the combination of augmented reality, which is AR, and virtual reality, which is VR. The digital self having a unique digital identifier that you can uh, move from uh, one place to another um, and having that identify with yourself. Having the blockchain um, or digital goods, again, things that retain their value as they are transposed from one um, uh, uh, environment into another, having common standards so that anybody can code into this, anybody can contribute, and having community-driven creation. Again, um, uh, one of the reasons that people are kind of leaning back a little bit from the whole Facebook announcement is that people aren't really seeing that Facebook would be leading to a fully community-driven metaverse, but I'll, I'll get into that a little bit later. So, so these really are the elements and you see, you know, this is a lot of the hot stuff that's going on right now. And so it's the metaverse itself. It's not just creating some fun environments in virtual reality. It's all of these things together. Again, just as the, the power of the internet was not just, you know, the web routers themselves, it's putting together the ability to make payments. It's putting, putting together the ability to have, to understand where your location is. All of these things were what made the, um, the internet transformational. And so it's all of these individual things together, unified, that's what's going to make the metaverse very powerful. So, so let's look. Let's look at each one of these things. And so, let's start off by looking at augmented, virtual, and extended realities. And um, and so, where we are today in these kinds of things is that um, we've got some really cool um, augmented reality that's uh, smartphone-based over 4G, so network talk here that matters to me. Um, if there's any mapping, it's it's two dimensional. And so the content, the kinds of things that we're seeing on our phones today, um, you know, you, you could argue that Pokemon Go, I mean, it's probably the most public example, but come on, was that really augmented reality? That was more of a location-based game rather than anything else. But, um, but, and that was in 2016, that's already five years ago. But the kinds of augmented reality that we're seeing today, not only is there a lot of augmented reality for branding, um, you know, point your phone at a Cheetos bag and the Cheetos bag seems to dance or, or whatever, um, but there's a lot of really interesting uses kind of cropping up around the world. For example, um, uh, Hong Kong, they've put these these round, uh, these red circular, effectively QR codes at various pla places around the city. And then if you go and you look at those with your camera, then it will show you um, what this place, you know, a, a 360 view of what did this place look like at some point in the history. And you can actually use your finger to slide on the screen back and forth between your actual, what you're seeing right now with your camera versus what this place looked like 50 or 100 years ago. And in a place of great, you know, rapid development like Hong Kong, you know, the, the, the difference is quite striking. Um, other things that um, uh, we're seeing people do is uh, KDDI in Japan. They're doing a lot of augmented reality where you know you're you're on your phone and and there's a door that's created and you can step through the door and into a store. And this one in in, in particular is a makeup store. So you can actually try on the makeup in augmented reality within the augmented reality store, all on your smartphone screen. So so this is starting to get into kind of an immersive situation on your phone. And in case you haven't done any of these door step through kinds of things, what happens is, you know, you, you, you physically walk forward in your space and go through the door and then, you know, your window into this world is still just your phone, but you can look all around and you're in a digital 360 degree environment and wherever your phone is pointing, it's showing that part of the environment. I hope I'm explaining that, <laughs> but, but in this, you know, it's an actual store and you can, you can do things. Um, and so, so these kinds of, you know, there's, there's, there's history, there's shopping, there's lots of interesting content coming up on this um, uh, smartphone, web-based AR. Most of this is browser-based on the phone, and um, and and they're they're. 
they're uh, they're good, but most of these are kind of one-off, and they're obviously the immersive factor is quite limited on the phone. So where is this going? Well, this again is why Nokia is interested in this, because the next wave of this is going to be 5G enabled, and I'll tell you why that's important. Um, headset mounted, the mapping becomes three-dimensional, and this is where we start getting the immersive content and that union of the physical and the digital world. So this little picture example here, that's an example, just walking through the grocery store and maybe the disc, what's on sale is being highlighted, or maybe you're lactose intolerant, and so it's highlighting the good products for you because you're lactose intolerant. But again, and this kind of example, this is totally a Bill Gates sitting here and saying, you can send email. This is what we can imagine imagine because we're in sitting here in this year. This is so, so not what the metaverse is really going to be used for. Uh, and that's why I've got a question mark here. We don't really know where this is going to develop into. And, and so, but it's this whole thing together, this is really the spatial internet, which is which is one aspect of the metaverse, this union of the information and the entertainment that's generally residing in the internet, having that woven into the space around you that you see as you move through it with your augmented reality, mixed reality headset. And the reason we don't have this yet today, and the reason 5G is important for this, is that there is some technical work that needs to be figured out here. For the kinds of headsets to do this kind of processing, they need to have a lot of computing, and that computing, if our, the headset's going to be something that people will actually wear, it needs to kind of be, you know, it needs to look like regular glasses. And the only way that you can actually have the massive computing power that's needed for this and have regular glasses is if you take the computing and you take it off of the glasses and you put it somewhere else. And the first place it's gonna go is to a smartphone that is linked to the glasses like the Nreal glasses, early Nreal glasses, they have a cable leading to a phone, but then, you know, over over something like 5G and then getting off the smartphone entirely and moving into the network. That is the long-term thing that we're seeing, which is why companies like telecommunications companies like us, this is why we're very interested in this. So, so, and so, so 5G still needs to be developed and the actual physical work of understanding what are the processes that need to happen here and then what are the processes that need to happen in the network doing that actual work. That's all happening today, which is why we don't have these yet, but they're coming soon, you know, and I'll, I'll show you why. And so, and so, and then the nice thing is that this whole, um, this whole part of uh, having the processing come off of the devices, it's not just augmented reality uh, glasses that are uh, actually going to be uh, fitting that, that network architecture because if we look at um today we have all of this fabulous devices with all this really high processing power but the chips they cost a lot of money they have they generate a lot of heat and the battery doesn't last very long and so not just for the augmented reality glasses but also for robotics and drone control for wireless virtual reality headsets for visual analytics you've got cheap cameras and for cloud gaming all of these things are actually depending on 5G to have the processing move into the network so the chip that goes onto that end device becomes really tiny. And that makes the device more affordable, cooler, and a much longer battery life. So that's, yeah, that's my inter industry's interest in all of this. And again, because this chip splitting is the, the rolling up the sleeves and actually making this happen, that's happening right now. That's why you haven't really seen this yet on the market, but I, tell you it is coming. So so here's that in real glasses that I mentioned earlier that have a cable leading to a smartphone. This is an interim step, as I said, in moving the processing off of the devices. Well, um, KDDI in Japan has been working with Enreal, um, uh, and so they've been doing some interesting things in uh, Shibuya. They put 5G all over the Shibuya ward of Tokyo, and if you go there and you put on the Enreal glasses, the first thing you'll see is hey, uh, virtual advertising. Yay! Okay. Um, fun for the money makers, not so much fun for the end user. So what are they doing to be fun for the end user? Well, they've created an entire ghost in the shell experience where they literally repaint 
the way that the city looks around you. And the storyline here is that, um, and, and now you start to see why we're here at Film Interactive, right? <laughs> um, where the, the buildings around you all seem to be glitching and then the electronic characters come up to you and say, oh no, somebody's hacking Tokyo, help, you're the only one who can save us. And so then you work with the computerized characters to save Tokyo. And um, uh, and so, yeah, so, so this is something that's available in the actual location, wearing the glasses, um, standing in the streets of Shibuya. And so this has been out there for a year already. They launched this back in March of 2020. Other things that are happening, uh, other early developments, uh, British Telecom uh, in the UK, they're working with um, linking with their sports broadcast. So using the embedded director signals in broadcasts to actually control a, um, an immersive experience at the user's home. And there's two elements to this that you can see here on the screen. One is the holograms that are live, real time, linked to the actual boxing match. They're also doing this for football as well. Or developing it, I should say. This project still has about eight more months to run. Um, so, but this is this is the uh, the ultimate vision. Um, and taking the graphics from the TV screen and and spl spreading them on the wall around the TV. Now, it's important to note that you see the viewers here. The four, sorry, the three young guys who are wearing the glasses. They're seeing what we're seeing in this picture. But the old guy, <laughs> who's apparently not interested in all this crazy new technology, he's not wearing the glasses, he would see a regular broadcast and the graphics would actually be appearing on the screen for him. And of course, he wouldn't be seeing the holograms on the table. So, but but uh, but this linkage to television broadcasts and using um, uh, signals within the television broadcast to trigger these kinds of immersive events at home, I think we're going to be seeing a lot of interesting activity there. And so, and so the, the uh, you know, I'm, I'm saying that these things are coming and, and I'm telling you this with great assurance because these are the companies that are working on making specifically mixed augmented reality glasses a thing. Apple, Microsoft, Google, Geo in India, and this is this is very important because they're hooking in the in great wealth of the developer community in India, getting them started on this from the start. Facebook, Niantic, which of course is the Pokemon Go company, Snap, and Amazon. These companies collectively are investing billions with a B of dollars into this concept. So the AR VR headset, yeah, it's going, we're going to be seeing it develop over the next couple of years. And sure, the early ones now are kind of clunky, but it's like mobile phones in 1993. Trust me, good ones are coming. And so, and so but the idea of getting these, uh, these glasses coming out, um, sometimes I get people who kind of lean back and they go, yeah, well, Google Glass didn't work, so how is this going to be any different? Well, some of the some of the use cases that I'm seeing, some of the ways that these the gla those companies that I just showed, some of the ways that they're talking about using the glasses, there are some differences. Now, Apple, for example, they have never publicly said that they're working on the glasses. However, we can look at their patents that they file because those are public. One of the patents they have filed is the ability to do vision correction with augmented reality glasses. That's a game changer for somebody like me who already wears glasses. And so I am already used to putting something on my head. I'm the easy one to convince to put on glasses if you can fix my vision at the same time. Huh, okay, vision correction. That brings up this very interesting um, uh, sensory enhancement concept. And oh, over at Facebook, they're also working on sensory enhancement, this time audio enhancement. And these are obviously lab prototypes, but these um, are, again, a head-mounted device that follows where your eyes are looking and then prioritizes the audio that is coming from whatever you are looking at. And so in this, obviously, laboratory setting, the man on the left, he's looking at the guy on the right, and so whatever the guy on the right is saying, that's what the guy on the left is going to hear most distinctly as opposed to the TV in the corner. But if he turns and he looks at the TV, then the TV audio will be prioritized over the other guy. Or if the waiter comes up to the table, now the waiter will be prioritized. So you can see how, how you know, oh, that actually makes sense for somebody who, you know, maybe has problems with, you know, attention or early hearing loss or something. Okay, that actually seems quite practical. And so, okay, so vision correction, audio enhancement. And then if we think of some other existing technologies like speech to text, hmm, okay, 
when I watch television now, I usually have the subtitles on. You know, I can hear just fine, but I like I like reading the subtitles. What if what if we had subtitles for just life around us? Oh, that's kind of compelling. That would be certainly possible with these kinds of glasses. And then once we have that, what about adding just one more step? Because now remember, we're accessing a whole bank of servers over here in the network, rather than relying just on the processing here or here. Once you've got that whole bank of servers in the network, well, why not instantaneous translation? So I've got translated subtitles or translated audio. Huh, okay, those are actually pretty useful things that maybe I would actually put on these glasses for and wear them for, okay, maybe all day. So now we're starting to see, these are the, I think, the ways that we're going to start seeing these take off in a mass market um, environment. But of course, if you have glasses, and actually, and let me uh, let, let take a moment just to think about this. Right now, I'm staring at a screen you're staring at a screen, whether it's a laptop screen or, or you know, a smartphone. Right now, the way that we interact with computers is for our eyes to dead end in a two-dimensional surface. And the significant change that happens if you take your computer interface and you move it from this external thing to this thing sitting on your face, and now I'm looking through my computing at the world, now the computing is seeing the world from the same perspective that I am. I am now able to reconnect directly with the actual world instead of always staring down at my screen. This is going to be huge, a huge transformation in the way we interact with technology. And another aspect of this though, is that if we are looking through our computing at the world, how do we interact with it? Okay, well, voice, obviously. But also, the, the glasses that are out there have front-facing cameras. And so this is a, from another Apple patent that we see, front-facing ca cameras for glasses. Um, this is an example from Enreal. When you have front-facing cameras, you can sense the hands of the person who's wearing the glasses. And if you have glasses that give you the ability to create visuals that aren't there, but the glasses knows where they are spatially and they know where your hands are spatially. And now you have the ability to create menus that can be interacted with by gesture. And Microsoft and Niantic demonstrated exactly this back in uh, the developers, Microsoft Developers Conference back in March of this year, where um, they had the CEO of Niantic outside wearing a HoloLens playing Pokemon Go, where it was entirely voice and gesture menu driven. That is that is the way that all of this is going. And you know, and are we one step away from Iron Man and Jarvis? Yes, yes we are. And what's actually really interesting is that um, if you think about you know this idea from the movies, the whole Jarvis interface um, interaction, the actual artists and companies that imagined that interface in the movies, they are now creating in the augmented reality space. And so, so a lot of, uh, actually we're seeing a huge amount of graphics work and a lot of VR and AR work taking off in Los Angeles because of the film industry. And so there's a really tight link here between the film industry and this whole augmented uh, uh, mixed reality world that's coming. Now, once you actually have all this, uh, what are some of the things that you can do? And again, you know, with the caveat that this is what we can imagine today. So it's really not anything that, right, this is all going to be so, people in the future are going to look back at this and go, is that all you could imagine? And so, you know, sure, con all kinds of context-based things. This, this is all from Facebook. Um, uh, one of them that I'll highlight here is this lower left, the ability to adjust the contrast in varying lighting conditions. So if you're trying to read a book and the light's kind of dim, you can change the contrast in your glasses without touching the light. So, okay, very nice eco-friendly way there for me to get brighter light in my, uh, in my living room here. Um, but, you know, this kind of, this, this, this picture from Magic Leap, this kind of immersive, again, user control is going to need to be very important here so that the user is only shown the things they're interested in. But, you know, uh, information about the traffic and restaurant reviews, information about the weather, um, you know, when is that street light going to change? That's a kind of informational sort of view. But looking at what KDDI did in Japan, you could also have, you know, entertainment views or looking at Hong Kong, you could have views of what did this place look like in 1850? all kinds of possibilities that, again, we're just only beginning to imagine the possibilities for. 
Now Qualcomm, uh, the chip maker, they actually are one of the companies that's really working hard on that chip splitting exercise that I talked about. And this is from their marketing materials. They're envisioning a time where you do have these mixed reality glasses that do have very strong potential to repaint selected elements of the world around you, to sense and repaint. And so in this case, you know, the staircase is being turned into, you know, the, the way it looks in, in this guy's favorite game, you know, or maybe here's your living room and, but you've been in lockdown for a long time. You want to see something else. And so, um, so mapping all of the elements in the living room to something that looks completely different. Uh, this is the kinds of things, uh, you know, and again, this is where when we start doing this, the merging between the world, our world, and a digital world that is very close to the world of film, this is all blurring together. All the colors on the palette are being mixed together here. Okay, so so that's kind of the, the, the foundational VR and AR part, which is extremely important. Now let me talk about some of these other elements. The digital self. Now, the whole idea of having an avatar in a game, um, yeah, okay, we're, we're, you know, we're comfortable with that, but having a self that does things in a digital space and it actually has meaning that, that holds the same meaning as it does in the physical world, um, that's, 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 that's the next step. And here I actually wanna say, it's really important to talk about the physical world this physical world and the digital world. Both of them are real. Okay, so don't say the real world when you mean the physical world. The digital world is just as real. Okay, so little. You know. <laughs> now, I, I forget myself sometimes because we're used to saying the real world when we mean the physical world, but they are both real. So, um, this is where COVID, for all of the harm and evil that COVID has been, there have been some good things. And one of them is that a huge number of things that would have happened in real life moved into the digital world because of COVID and people began to accept that the digital representation was as meaningful as the physical representation would have been. In fact, this conference right now, if it weren't for COVID, I would be standing in front of you in person. But, but, it, but it wasn't just you know, things like conferences and, and meetings, things like graduations, weddings, even funerals, they moved online. And where a lot of this stuff went was into games, Minecraft, Roblox, tons of like kids graduation ceremonies happened in these platforms. And, and, and even though they happened digitally only, they held the same meaning. And so people started to understand that their digital self could actually participate in digital things and have it actually have value. And, and this, is, this is a wedding that actually happened in Animal Crossing. What if my friends just happened to stumble across this? It was a couple of them in Australia during the, you know, back in May of last year, uh, total lockdown, and they got married in Animal Crossing and invited all of their friends in Animal Crossing. And all kinds of strangers sent them all kinds of gifts and everything. It was actually a very beautiful moment. So, so yeah, um, taking things into, you know, so people understanding the digital self can be yourself. And then, so then we've got companies like Wolf 3D, um, they're Ready Player Me. They are creating avatars and they're working with more and more other platforms so that you can take your avatar created there and then port it to other apps. So you could have the same avatar in alt space that you have in uh, 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 Grand Theft Auto. Um, and this, this obviously is an idea and a concept still under development, but this, this constant avatar kind of thing is definitely um, a key foundation of the metaverse. So digital goods, okay, the whole economy. Now this gets us into the whole NFT thing. Um, and so, you know, in the nifty gateway and all the NFTs and all the artworks there, um, that's a whole other big topic. But, but yeah, I think it's kind of inescapable at this point that blockchain is going to be some kind of a foundation for the economy in the metaverse. But whether, how much, whether it's the whole economy or part of it or, you know, whatever, um, the ability to have digital goods that can hold unique value and can be ported from one platform in one environment to another, that's the concept that really needs to develop. And, and what's, what's really cool is that one of the great things, great, great things about digital goods is 
is that um, they, they hold their value. So for, for the creator, sorry, that's the important part, for the creator. So if you create something, um, some kind of NFT, every time it is sold, you get a cut you, the original artist, you get a cut. And this is actually a really important concept because, you know, when you see a Van Gogh selling for, you know, $35 million at Sotheby's, Van Gogh didn't see any of that money. You know, the heirs of Van Gogh don't see any of that money. It's just the previous owner that sees it, um, part of that money. So, so digital, the creation of digital goods, it not only democratizes the ability to create individual objects of value and so you know so people are already making a living by creating digital goods for avatars in, in places like roblox um uh you know and, and major brands are getting into this as well but the idea that that artists can continue to earn from their creations being sold on that's you know oh you know so near and dear to my heart you know that's that that's just very very beautiful and necessary um and so and so we're starting to actually see again you know these online digital activities that have real world consequences and so for example um hellman's which is a, a if you're not familiar it's a mayonnaise brand <laughs> um hellman's in canada they um they created an island in animal crossing now in animal crossing turnips are kind of the the stock market uh, exchange item and but if you don't sell your turnips in time they spoil they go bad and they don't have any value anymore so Hellman's actually created an island where if you go there and you drop off your spoiled turnips they will actually donate to a food bank and you know give money uh, sorry give food to people who don't have any and so so this is so again this is this early examples of how digital actions with your avatar using digital goods can start to have real world consequences. Oh, I did it. I said it. Real world. I meant physical world. Ah, see, so hard. Um, and so, 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 yeah, so we're starting to see all these different elements come together and the way that they're linking together, um, you know, it's still, it's going to take years for all of this to weave together, but we can see these things moving into place. And that's the exciting part. So where are, where are there, there's metaverse platform players out there. And so Microsoft announced that their, their mesh was going to allow um, virtual holographic meetings. Um, and this of course is using their Azure. So it's not exactly open standards, but um, where, you know, I, I can have a HoloLens and you can have uh, some other kind of VR headset or a phone and we can virtually meet and discuss things um, without actually having to be fully in a virtual reality um, uh, immersive thing. So much more located in the physical world. Um, uh, Vario, which actually has, um, they've got the absolute top-notch virtual reality headset right now. It's really for enterprise only. It's screamingly expensive, but it's um, really apparently a mind-blowingly good experience. Um, they actually are they're kind of coming at this metaverse with virtual teleportation where you with your Vario headset, you can 3D scan the environment that you're in and it will create a 3D digital copy that you can then invite other people to come into that copy and then you two can together go through this digital copy of your actual physical space and and they're they're labeling that metaversey okay great and then another uh kind of approach to the metaverse nvidia has created their omniverse where they're actually they're looking at universal um interoperability you can see all these big companies they're they're hoping to become the default central mechanism and they're all trying from these different ways it's going to be a battle we'll see we'll see who wins but what nvidia is doing is they're really allowing lots of sharing of digital goods and digital assets and for example activision is using nvidia's omniverse um to to um to catalog you know a hundred thousand different items from their various games so that they can be easily ported and reused in other kinds of um properties and so uh and and then and then so you don't have to build things from scratch you can actually use the digital library that's already out there and so so this one's really about collaborating and sharing for cr the creation of um immersive environments and so so just to kind of you know wrap all this up here um this has been a very quick tour there's so much more but you know in the interest of time let me, let me stop it there who, you know, who for the metaverse? Well, your cross-platform avatar, doing things in digital spaces that have the same significance and meaning that, that we used to 
really only have in the physical world. And actually, the fact that I'm presenting to you like this right now, you know, this is a beginning. Um, you're seeing a picture of me, you know, next time maybe it's a, a, a 3D avatar of me standing in front of you. But what having blockchain supported digital goods as the foundation for the economy um, and not just money for the big guys, but lots of uh, uh, lots of uh, value to the actual creators who make things, making this very democratized, but also showing that there will be a ton of money in this space. Um, yeah, this is this is not going to be a little hobbyist uh, kind of thing. This really is going to be it's going to be big. Um, where access through augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality. So I have both everywhere and nowhere written here because it really will be everywhere and nowhere because through virtual reality, we'll be able to access just completely imagined worlds and, and share and interact with each other there. But the linkage to the physical world is actually extremely important because that brings everything that's around us every day and into and combined with the the fully imaginary worlds of of the fully digital immersive things and so yeah i, I mean i just as you can see i'm very excited about this i really i really can't wait for this for this all to get come around and so and so yes how through community creation yes there will be big default platforms and as i said we have to figure out you know who's going to win that particular battle but unless there's community creation with agreed standards you know, a single company building something and then inviting everybody to play in there only by their own rules. <coughs> Oculus. <coughs> um, uh, eh, we'll see. We'll see. Um, and so when? Ah, when? That's a good question. I, I had a colleague ask me, um, oh, Leslie, can you help me brainstorm what the world's going to look like in 2025? <laughs> and I said, um, it's actually a lot easier to brainstorm what 2030 is going to look like, because all of these different things that I talked about, they're all on different trajectories. They're all on different rhythms. They're going to have breakthroughs. There's still technical work that needs to be done. They're going to have breakthroughs at different times. And then what? how these, these things come together, because it's the coming together that's the magic. Um, by 2030, I think most of it's going to be in place. By 2025, some of it's going to be in place, but I'm not really sure which parts. <laughs> so, so, so we all just have to kind of like lean back and and be a little patient, and and help it happen where we see the metaverse happening. Help it happen, and and think about the metaverse not just as something happening in virtual reality, but all of these different um, elements coming together and unifying them. It's about unity, and it's about it's about working together, and 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 one of the best like kind of new things that I can think of and see um, because we can start imagining some of the new, not just, you know, being able to know what the weather is before you leave the house. Um, there's a guy out there, you know, shout out to this, this random person. I don't know who you are, Voxel guy, but this guy named Voxel guy, um, he uh, has, he's a Unity developer and he'd already done a model of his living room um, for, for some other project. And one day he's vacuuming and he's like, oh my God, this is so boring. <laughs> I can do better than this. So he anchored his Unity creation of his living room to his actual living room and he connected his VR controller to his vacuum cleaner and then in his uh, virtual living room, he dropped euros all over the floor that then were vacuumed up with his physical world vacuum cleaner as he's actually vacuuming in the physical world. So this is that unity of the digital and the virtual. And he gamified vacuum cleaning. I mean, Voxel guy, mwah, I love you so, so much. Because this, oh, oh, and then at the end, when he collected up, you know, a whole bunch of uh, imaginary euros, to be clear, then uh, once he had gotten every single euro, so of course that made sure that he vacuumed everywhere in the living room, then this uh, 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 button appeared on his virtual desk and he could press the button with his virtual vacuum cleaner and he bought some kind of digital good it's like, it looks like a little spaceship that would drop down onto the desk gamifying routine mundane tasks in the physical world how spectacular will this be i mean you know getting the kids to walk the dog getting the kids to clean their room making laundry more interesting yes bring it and and also think about think about tie-ins to things that might happen in film or tv for example maybe i was watching um 
top chef and 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 you know and oh the winning recipe for tonight now i can download the recipe um i can cook it at home and my augmented reality glasses are assessing my skills as i'm cooking and so am i chopping the onions finely enough you know did i reach the correct brownness and the searing of the pork chop um and then how does the whole thing you know look plated and this is all using visual analytics through th through my glasses and then i get a score and then i can see how i did against all the other people who tried that recipe uh, I, I, yeah the ability to make it possible for people to participate with the things that they see on tv um and in film uh yeah i think it's going to be massive in fact one of the things squid game uh, you know, uh, huge in the United States right now. And within like a week of Squid Game coming to Netflix in the United States, there was the ability to play several of the games in Squid Game um, in Roblox um, and on uh, in Oculus. So, so people, and this is fan created stuff. And so, well, let's, let's, this is, this is the opportunity for people to live what they see in the entertainment. Yeah, it's, it's going to be huge. It's absolutely going to be huge. And so so let's just, we started with Bill Gates. Let's close with Bill Gates. Famous quote, we always overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years and underestimate the change that will occur in the next 10. Don't let yourself be lulled into inaction. That means just because you don't see things moving very quickly around you right now, don't think that change is not coming. Change is coming. And and it's going to look like a computer on your head, and that's going to completely change how we see and interact with the world and our media all around us. And just as a very final note, I can talk about this because I've been with Nokia for 21 years. And back in 2000, when I joined Nokia, this is what mobile data looked like. Only seven years later, this is what mobile data looked like. And yes, that's a Nokia on the left, and that's an Apple on the right, because we know more than anybody how quickly the change happens once the elements fall into place and interlock with each other in a good way. And the companies that are not thinking the right way or thinking about the future will get left behind. When that first iPhone came out, we at Nokia, we laughed at it because it was a terrible telephone. It had a really bad antenna. It was only 2.5 G. We're like, it's not a telephone. Well, what we didn't understand was that, no, it wasn't a telephone. It was actually a computer. That was the moment that the thing in your pocket shifted from being a telephone to a computer, and we missed it. There is going to be a similar change around the metaverse and the immersiveness of our interaction with technology, and that will happen between now and 2030. So tighten your seatbelt and hang on because it is going to be a wild ride. Thank you very much.